El petróleo Oil is a topic of utmost importance. And to speak with His Excellency Mohamed Barkindo, Secretary General of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, it is without a doubt a great privilege. Welcome. Thank you for accepting Telesur's invitation. Thank you very much for having me. I'm glad to return to Telesur. Your visit to Venezuela comes a few days after an OPEC meeting with 10 other petroleum producing countries that do not belong to the organization where it was decided to maintain the policy of a steady increase of production with a modest increase in world production of oil while the United States and the West intend to produce oil without limits. What consequence would OPEC member nations face if production is increased today. Thank you very much for this important question. I feel very honored, and it's a great pleasure for me to return to Caracas, to Venezuela, my second home. And I want to respond to your important questions as follows. When you step back into July, August 2021, we had started the last phase of the implementation of our historical agreements that we reached with non OPEC countries in April 2020, when we saw an unprecedented collapse in oil demand. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, we were astounded. We decided not to reinvent the wheel. Because if you recall back in 2016, we negotiated and reached the historical agreement resulting in the Declaration of Cooperation, which brought OPEC and non-OPEC producing countries together for the first time to take decisions to, together, to implement decisions together, and for the implementation together. Observers thought it was impossible, but we continue with this, and we have been together with our partners until COVID struck in 2020. And we took this unprecedented decision to readjust supply in global markets by a hoping 9.7 million barrels a day. And we started implementing the last year. We projected that by 2022, we have been able to release all the outstanding volumes to the markets, and we also decided to do something unique, to meet monthly, to monitor the market and how the market responds, to the monthly release in the last meeting that we had last week in Vienna. We took stock in the implementation and, and the progress we have made with the stabilization of the market. And we decided to continue this gradual but predictable and timely monthly releases if all remain the same by September this year, we would have liquidated the entire 5.8 million barrels a day outstanding. But in this scenario, after the COVID pandemic, the conflict in Ukraine began, and in some countries, people say that OPEC refuses to react in the face of increased oil prices worldwide. What do you think? Quite to the contrary, Rolando. I, I told you that way back in July, 
August of 2021, we took a long view of the market and the global economy recovery after the pandemic, and we saw a very ro robust growth recovery in 2021. In fact, we saw the global economy grow by nearly 5.75 to 5.8% in 2021. And correspondingly, we also saw demand for oil grow by over 5.7 million barrels a day. And hence the decision to continue to release 400,000 barrels a day every month. And this we have to continue in addition to that. I told you about the monthly meeting to monitor how the market responds to the monthly releases. And so far, there is no shortage of physical oil in the global market. But we do see sanctions against Russia. There's a plan for a full embargo in six months on Russian oil. Is there any possibility that the world market can develop without that oil? All I can tell you is that there is no doubt there is significant volatility in the oil market, not only in the oil market, but in all commodities in general, as a result of geopolitical events taking place in Europe in particular, in particular the war in Ukraine, and the reason is that Russia our partner in the Declaration of Cooperation is among the three largest producers and exporters of oil in the world. Russia exports on average between 7.5 to 7.8 million barrels a day of crude oil and petroleum products every single day. Now, the world today has no spare capacity to replace these exports, and hence the reaction of the markets. We in OPEC have tried in the last 60 years plus of the existence of the organization to adhere to the two core principles that were agreed upon here in Caracas in 1961, led by Perez Alfonso of Venezuela, and the other founding members of OPEC when they met here to design the statues of OPEC. And they decided that this organization, OPEC, must not be a political organization. The organization should be in insulated from geopolitics and secondly, oil should never be politicized. And in the last 60 years plus, OPEC has adhered to these key principles And I must say, we have done very well in that regard because we have gone through seven oil cycles in the 60 years, including the COVID pandemic. And we have also had the unfortunate incident of two of four founding members fighting a war for eight years. We also had a very unfortunate situation where one of our founding members countries invaded another member country. And in all these unfortunate occasions, the organization tried to adhere to the principles laid out by our Pablo Perez Alfonso and his colleagues. 
OPEC should not be impacted by geopolitics. We should not get ourselves involved with geopolitics. And we should do everything possible to depoliticize oil. Therefore, any attempt by the international community or groups of countries to sanction oil, at the end of the day, we will be, we will be sanctioning ourselves because the impacts of these sanctions are felt beyond the boundaries of the countries that are targeted with sanctions. Now the situation in Europe, we have seen how prices continue to skyrocket, not only in oil and gas, but in minerals, in metals, in corn, and in the prices of bread in many countries of the world. So I want to use this opportunity that you are giving me in Telesur for which I'm very grateful for, to call on world powers, the leaders of this world, not to give up. We must find a solution to conflicts. We must find a solution to wars, dialogue, peaceful, dialogue in the way out. We should always work towards the triumph of peace over, over war the triumph of, a, of dialogue over conflict. It is a very responsibility that falls on the shoulders of the world powers. But amidst of this geopolitical struggle for the control of resources, countries react, and Russia, for example, demands to trade its oil in rubles. What's your take on that initiative? How does it impact the oil market? These are the sovereign decisions of any producer and exporting country to decide how buyers of the crude or products should be paid. It is their sovereign decision. What other consequences have these sanctions caused? Not only we now see it, it due to this conflict in Ukraine, but we have also seen it here in Venezuela, the sanctions imposed on the oil sector. I have said it loud and clear on different occasions including my last visit to Telesur in September of 2021, that the sanctions on Venezuela, a founding member of OPEC, and a country that sits on the largest proven oil reserves in the world. These are sanctions against the entire global community. It is a right of all citizens of the world to have access to, to have access to energy and in the midst of the abject energy poverty that many parts of the world are battling with. If you encumber the production and exports of these reserves that are domiciled in, you, in Venezuela, you're not only targeting Venezuela, but targeting the rest of the world. We have been suffering because the capacity of the world to continue to produce and export to global markets is hindered. And has been impacted by the, these decisions. And this has shrunk the capacity of the Venezuelan industry to fulfill to fulfill that noble role of a reliable and dependable supply of oil to global markets. Global 
we have been consistent in urging world powers to find a solution to this encumbrance. But I'm very glad during this visit, I visited the, the Jose Antonio Petrochemical Complex in Barcelona yesterday. And I saw practically what the young engineers and workers in this complex have achieved in transforming this complex, in reviving the complex, in recovering the lost capacity, and the extreme circumstances of this situation that we're talking And I sincerely hope that they will sustain this recovery process. And I have no reason to doubt, as Drubal Chavez, the president of PDVSA, and his staff in Barcelona, because they are truly heroes in this industry. They have done a wonderful transformation that was unheard of in this his history of oil. Before continue deepening on your visit to Venezuela, I wanted to make a first question that has to do with a topic discussed in the U.S. Senate in regards to a law that has been debated for several years, but it is now back on the table, and it is the possibility of sanctioning OPEC based on anti-monopoly sanctions. Is it possible that the United States to sanction OPEC or other oil producers and exporting nations? Yes, I believe you are referring to the OPEC law in the U.S. Congress. You are quite right. This bill has, has been in and out of various Congresses in the last couple of decades of the existence of OPEC. And we have always tried to persuade our U.S. friends that OPEC and its existence is in the interest of all producers of oil. including the United States oil industry, and also all consumers of oil, therefore any encumbrance on the ability to, of the organization to continue to fulfill its noble role in maintaining stability on a sustainable basis in the oil industry would be inimical to the economic interests of the world. I understand that this is your sixth visit to Venezuela. Here I have the report of your previous visit, a bulletin published by OPEC. But what role is or has Venezuela played in this organization? Venezuela is one of the 13 member nations of OPEC and also one of the founders. What has been Venezuela's real role? Thank you very much for this very, very important question, Rolando. OPEC is Venezuela. Venezuela is OPEC. There was a hero in this country, a visionary leader, a leader, a scholar, who thought of the idea of getting all producers of hydrocarbons in the world to form an organization to protect the interest of these natural resources and to continue to maintain stability on a sustainable basis. This hero was called Pablo Perez Alfonso. And this was as far back as 1959. It was Perez Alfonso 
that persuaded the other founding members of OPEC, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, together with Venezuela, and met in Baghdad in September of 1960. And they founded this organization. And I made reference to the following year in 1961. They returned to Caracas and drafted the statutes of OPEC. And since then, Venezuela has taken the lead in the affairs of OPEC at various times and twists in the life of this organization that is 60 years plus, you will find that Venezuela was in the lead to protect the interest of the organization, to protect its cohesion, to ensure that the organization continues to function efficiently and effectively in line with the aspiration, the vision of the founders in the year 2000, if you recall. They had written OPEC off many of the local global media because it was literally dysfunctional. It was another hero. A global leader in the name of Hugo Chavez who came and said no. We must protect this organization this organization is not only working for Venezuela, nor for OPEC member countries only, but for all producers and exporters of hydrocarbons, and indeed for consumers as well, because the core principle of maintaining stability in the oil market on a sustainable basis is in the interest of the producer and the consumer. And Commander Hugo Chavez, I remembered visited all members of the countries of OPEC, and I met him for the first time in Abuja, capital of Nigeria, being part of the delegation that received him. And he convinced all the leaders that they had a sacred duty to revive OPEC. And they all agreed with him. And he hosted the second summit of OPEC heads in which I had the honor of participating. In 2015, 2016, we entered into another stormy water because the oil market went into a massive disequilibrium supply. Supply outpassed demand. And oil inventories in the world reached unprecedented levels. Over 400 million barrels over the five years average There was no space to store oil in the world, and prices crashed to $10, and the naysayers came back and said yes. This is the time, this is the end of OPEC. And then the true leader, Nicolás Maduro, of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, sprung up and took up the challenge and played a leading role and decisive role. In inviting known OPEC producers to join us, to work with us, to restore balance and equilibrium in the markets. That historic decision, called the Declaration of Cooperation, I can tell you would have been impossible without the intervention of President Maduro. Therefore, we in OPEC, and indeed all producing countries, are deeply grateful for the leadership and heroic role of Venezuela 
in the life of this organization. This morning here in Venezuela, there was a homage done in your name, and I saw you very emotional, and you had some words for Venezuela. You also said that there was a historic transformation in the oil sector. How historic has that transformation been for you who know about oil in Venezuela at different moments? What message does it deliver to OPEC and the rest of the world? When Venezuela was besieged with these unfair and extreme sanctions, it impacted the oil industry in this country. And despite the fact that Venezuela is sitting on the largest proven oil reserve in the world, its production and export shrunk to the extent we exempted Venezuela and other countries, including Nigeria, from the agreement we reached 2016 because of the impact of the sanctions. Some of the facilities, I was told, were completely abandoned and they were shut down. One key one is the Jose Antonio Petrochemical Complex in Barcelona that I visited yesterday, and they took me around. I visited, and I saw myself how they revived this complex, how they recovered the capacity of this complex, the upgraders, the refiners, the petrochemical units, and the urea units. And when I asked, I was told that, that it took them two years to achieve this miracle. I have been in the oil industry most of my working life. And I also had the fortune of serving as CEO of our national oil company. So I know the challenges of running this industry, even in times of peace and stability, let alone under these extreme conditions that these men and women that I saw in Jose Antonio did. I told Asdrubal Chavez, the CEO of PDVSA, that you have done a miracle here. First, in reviving this complex, you are now ahead of your target in terms of recovery of your production capacity. You are now on the path to returning to 2 million plus barrels a day production. Your refinery is functioning optimally there are no shortages, and you're not importing one barrel of refined products. Your international partners have left you. Have you mobilized, and you mobilized, you provided leadership together with my brother, Tarek El Asami, the Minister of Oil, under the able guidance and leadership of Al Khalifa Nicolás Maduro. and inspired these young men to do, the mir to do this miracle. I have called interested parties, not only in OPEC, but in the industry, to avail themselves of this new model, new management model, because what they did was revolutionary. They, they set aside all the traditional business models that we read in colleges, in business schools, and universities, set all of them aside, formed a warm room with Tarek Asami as their general, and they decided to do this as a matter of survival for their country.
And in two years, they achieved this. This is inspiring to all OPEC member countries that we can do it if Venezuela can do it. We can do it. And the global oil industry has a lot to learn from what these young men and women did in Jose Antonio. Finally, I understand that soon you'll finish your term as head of OPEC. What can you say about your management? Will OPEC continue to be an instrument of peace, of justice, as Chavez used to say? I have told you so, how we survived the, the last 60 years. I cannot remember how many times the world media wrote our funeral tribute. And I know of no organization in history that has survived several funerals like OPEC. Therefore, I have no doubt in my mind that OPEC is here to stay. And it will continue to perform its noble role and objectives of maintaining stability in global oil markets and continue to be reliable suppliers of oil. Dependable suppliers to global consumers. We will continue to face headwinds if there is anything that is certain in today's world is uncertainty. We have adapted ourselves to these uncertainties and we are not only working as an organization of certain countries, thanks to President Nicolás Maduro. He helped us to bring 10 other non-OPEC producing countries to work with us. And we have started working since January 2017. And despite COVID, despite the geopolitical event in Europe, we have continued to work with these partners because we are all resolved that this marriage between OPEC and non-OPEC is a, Catho a Catholic marriage. There is no divorce. We may have our differences from time to time, like every couple, but the marriage is in the interest of the world. If there was no OPEC, if there was no Perez Alfonso, some people would have created OPEC. Today I read in the news that a respected prime minister from Europe is floating the idea of forming an OPEC. But for all oil consuming countries, so isn't that a confirmation that we have passed the litmus test of the time? Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency Barquindo, for your time and thoughts for Telesur. Thank you very much, Rolando, for having me. Thanks to our viewers as well for joining us in this special interview to the Secretary General of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries.